Um, I want to give you an overview of our research activities uh, in, in the department. Um, maybe first to provide a bit of a general overview. So um, for me in cognitive neuroscience, so we are cognitive neuroscience lab. So we are interested in higher level cognitive functions and how those higher level cognitive functions are implemented in the human brain. So we are doing non, -in usually as our key research tool, we use non-invasive neuroimaging tools, usually fMRI, but also a little bit of EEG, MEG research. And of course, uh, a lot of behavior work, developing new cognitive paradigms to identify uh, uh, cognitive processes, sub-processes, really try to understand how cognition works. And for me, this was actually um, uh, almost 25 years ago. I'm, I'm, I had my initial training in experimental psychology, so I usually think in terms of experimental paradigms, changing uh, small aspects in, in a paradigm to really understand the sub-processes sub of cognition. And for me, the starting point into neuroscience was, uh, was it's almost 25 years ago, um, where I got really fascinated in episodic memory. And um, how how did I excited about uh, did I get excited about memory? So memory in, in general is a, is a very interesting and exciting uh, cognitive domain. Um, our whole personality depends, of course, on our episodic memories, the specific memories of events, birthday parties, conversations with colleagues, and so forth. And these myriads of episodes they form basically um, our the definition almost of, of ourselves because we live in our memories and these examples, these severe examples of uh, degradation of episodic memory, spatial memory function in, for instance, neurodegenerative diseases always illustrate uh, uh, how severe the deficits can be. So um, memory is, is really key, I think, to understand cognition in more general also because uh, memory interacts with other cognitive areas. It's very important to memorize aspects for subsequent decision making. Uh, memory is the basis initially in terms of one short learning to build knowledge structures and so forth. Memory is highly important in interactions with language. So of course I have a bias being a memory researcher myself, but it is a really core cognitive uh, faculty. Um, then I wanted to tell you a little bit the story about neuroscience, why I got interested about neuroscience before I did only as a student behavioral studies, but then I realized actually during an internship at the Neuroscience Institute that understanding the brain can actually help me to understand cognition. And I was really fascinated by a paper I read at the time, it was a preprint or it wasn't called that at the time, it was sort of the accepted version of a paper which was then in the year 2000 published in Science by Guillen Fernandez and colleagues neurologists, epileptologists at Bonn University Hospital, where they recorded intracranial uh, local field potentials from epilepsy patients from the hippocampus, from the hippocampus and the surrounding entorhinal and perirhinal cortex. And what they, uh, so the, the, the electrodes were implanted for, for medical reasons to identify uh, the source of the severe epilepsies the patients were suffering from. And they, uh, in, in that time window, when the patients had the electrodes implanted, they recorded in a verbal list learning task. So participants had to learn words, and later, next day, they had to recall these words. And then, based on the memory performance of participants, um, on the second day, they went back and looked at their local field potential data from the hippocampus and sorted items into later forgotten and later remembered items. And what they see is a clear signature, an LFP signature of subsequently remembered versus forgotten items in a hippocampus and actually entorhinal cortex. So for me as a student at the time, this is what was the memory trace. And that's why, and that's fascinated me so much that I turned slowly and gradually into a neuroscientist to understand, in the end, still understand how cognition works, but from a neuroscience perspective. And um, to broaden sort of the perspective a little more, we know a lot about the hippocampus, of course, based on all our psychological work, especially the neuropsych psychology, patient HM, I think you're very familiar with, with all that, that the major discoveries which have been made in the 50s and 60s of the last century in terms of the deficits related to lesions to the hippocampus in terms of episodic but also spatial memory deficit. From a 
from a rodent, from an animal model neuroscience perspective, the major discoveries were made in the 60s, 70s of the last century and of course continued, um, culminating basically or starting with the discovery of the so-called play cells by John O'Keefe discovered in 1971 at UCL in London. And this is just an illustration of such a play cell activity. So there's this yellow spot here. So when, when animals navigate in a, in a recording environment, like a box, a square meter box, and you record from single cells, so you effectively record the electrical activity of single units or single cells in the hippocampus, which is illustrated here in orange in the rodent brain. Um, I guess you see my uh, my pointer, but maybe that's easier. Let me check whether there's a better one. No, I think that's okay. I guess you can see that. So here's the hippocampus, illustration of the hippocampus. And the, the researcher records from single units, single cells in the hippocampus. And when you plot activity as a function of the position of the animal within the recording box, you see these beautiful firing fields emerging. So single play cells, single hippocampus cells, fire at a specific position in the environment. And when you record from multiple of those cells, what you usually see is that different cells fire at different positions. And what we assume is that together on the population level, the entire hippocampal play cell population forms a stable representation or cognitive map of the environment. So this is the hippocampal map of the environment. Maybe to, to already um, anticipate or illustrate two key features of these hippocampal cognitive maps, it's first of all highly dynamic. So when the animal enters a new room, a new map is formed. So a population of cells fires at different locations, together they form a map representation of the environment. But it's also very stable, the map. So when you enter uh, the room again after a couple of uh, days, the same cell population fires at the same position. So um, the map is reactivated when the animal um, enters a familiar environment. But of course, when it enters a new environment, the new map is formed. So it's a highly stable, but at the same time, highly dynamic um, system, which of course is, is a very important source uh, or a very important prerequisite for forming new memories and at the same time, keeping these memories, consolidating these memories. Then many years ago, uh, many years later, uh, Edward and Maybrit Moser in Trondheim in Norway discovered the so-called grid cells in entorhinal cortex. So an illustration you can see here in this blue schematic. So they record, the discovery was made or published in 2005, um, in the entorhinal cortex. So that's just the cortical structure nearby the hippocampus, just one synapse, one connection away from the, from the hippocampus. And in contrast to the play cells, where a single cell usually only fires at a single position, these grid cells, these entorhinal grid cells fire, the single cells fire at multiple locations. And they fire in this beautiful, it's only a schematic here, but the real data look almost as beautiful. They fire in this very characteristic um, uh, hexagonal, hexadirectional firing pattern. And that's why they term them grid cells. So, and these two cells, have, they provide basically a metric of the, of, of the spatial environment stability. You can calculate distances and orientation based on that uh, grid cell map. And the play cells and the grid cells are not alone in the system. So there are, it's really a large number of very specific spatially tuned cell types in the system. You also have, for instance, head direction cells, you can call them compass cells uh, in, in, in the structure, especially in entorhinal cortex, which encode the direction, the running direction of, or head direction of the animal. So they provide orientation information, but not position information. You have cells which encounter or encode um, the presence of environmental boundaries in the environment or uh, uh, objects in the environment. You have cells which encode the running speed of the animal. And together, these spatially tuned cell types, this zoo of spatially tuned cell types provides a map-like representation, a set uh, in the rodent brain. So that's the biological basis of the system. Uh, as you as you all know, this discovery on places, especially the discovery of place and grid cells, uh, was awarded with the Nobel Prize to O'Keefe and the Mosers in 2014, 10 years ago. So how are we related to these, uh, these systems neuroscience biological findings? So what we believe, and I show you a couple of showcase examples of that work. We think that we also have 
a navigation system like that in the human brain and we develop techniques to measure that non-invasively with analytical and measurement tricks uh, to circumvent sort of the limitation of our approach in terms of getting, uh, of course, only a sluggish average signal from our MR machines. But what we think is going on is that possibly as a function of evolution, we don't know, this hippocampal, the SNAP system in the hippocampal, uh, in the hippocampal structures, um, they are not only there to help us navigate the world, but also help us to um, structure other sorts of experiences. Uh, and I illustrate one example here. This is uh, a, a schematic of a representation of your car or vehicle space you might have in your brain and your mind. And you could, for instance, arrange vehicles along two arbitrary dimensions. And that could, for instance, be the weight of um, uh, of of the vehicle and the engine power of the vehicle on the other dimension. So you have a low over here, the heavy vehicle and has a high engine power. You have a, a racing Formula One car over here, which also has a high engine power, but is relatively light compared to the low and so forth. And the small van over here. So you can structure this information, this experience in terms of what we call cognitive spaces. Um, and uh, we think that the spatial machinery in the hippocampal system uh, has can be repurposed or has been repurposed in humans to support other cognitive faculties, other cognitive domains, like in that case, the knowledge representation. And again, um, the system is stable, so you have a stable representation of vehicles. But if you change the task demands, imagine you have to buy a new family car, uh, then weight and engine power might not be that relevant for you, but the price and the number of seats for children might be more relevant. And the entire re vehicle space might be rearranged, remapped uh, to uh, accommodate the, the needs of your current task. Of course, we are not alone with that theoretical idea. We are based on the, basically on the shoulders of giants going back to the cognitive map theory of Tolman in uh, developed or published first published in 48. Uh, then the, the revisit of that idea in the context of the discovery of the plate cells by O'Keefe and Nadell with their famous book in 78. Other researchers from biology like Howard Eichenbaum or cognitive science like Peter Gerdenfors followed up on these ideas and many more. So that's the theoretical basis uh, basically of our, our work. And um, you can summarize that as follows, so that we are looking for these cognitive spaces in the or the representation of these cognitive spaces in the brain, which are effectively low dimensional representations for any sort of cognitive variables. And uh, this research has, even after the Nobel Prize, gained huge momentum with a lot of experimental work in spatial and non spatial domains, looking at abstract task spaces, looking at the neural geometry of these low dimensional representations, but also computationally. A lot of new computational models have been developed to integrate the findings we have from systems neuroscience in terms of the, uh, the, the biological basis, but also in terms of the, uh, the behaviors, the different types of complex higher and lower uh, co uh, you know, behaviors with high and low complexity, how that are supported by these low dimensional representation. I want to briefly illustrate one of these models very uh, briefly. I'm not a computational neuroscience. I don't know, understand the inner working of the models, but one model is really fantastic. It's the Tobin Eichenbaum uh, machine uh, developed by Whittington and Tim Behrens at Oxford University a couple of years ago that beautifully integrates sort of the the relevant aspects uh, of uh, what's going on in the system. And um, the, the TEM basically unifies the hippocampal roles in spatial and non-spatial processing and suggests that the hippocampal antiviral representations enable generalization by what we would call factorized representation of the structure of the environment. And um, there are basically three key elements here. So that's the structural representation in meal and rhinal cortex. That's where um, the, the grid cells reside. So when you take the example of, um, uh, for instance, Natalia going when she was in Leipzig, uh, going to the local grocery uh, shop, the supermarket, and wants to find some food, she has, of course, already based on her experience, 
a concept of how a supermarket looks like. Uh, but of course, she has never been in that very specific supermarket around the corner here of the Institute. So, but she has this important structural information. When you enter a supermarket, market, usually it starts with the fruits and uh, you find the ice cream in the fridges. And when you pay at the end, you might be able also to get some chewing gum, which usually uh, is, is laid out there. So this structural information is very important. But then, of course, the system somehow needs to combine the structural information, you can also call it a schematic representation of context of, of facts and so forth to the sensory specifics. The sensory specifics, of course, this is the visual auditory input coming through the sensory cortices and then uh, converging in the lateral entorhinal cortex in the hippocampal system. And then you need to somehow bring this sensory specific information. So any new input from that new supermarket and the structural information, your knowledge about how a supermarket is in generally organized and arranged together. And that's what the hippocampus does. It does, it does this sort of flexible binding, basically providing pointers, combining the sensory specific information and providing pointers into this abstract map in the medial entorhinal cortex in this, in this grid cell map. And, um, uh, again, what is really relevant here, then we think that this system can provide abstract structural knowledge that allows generalization, that you can really transfer your knowledge from your supermarket concept to that very specific new supermarket in Leipzig and uh, other aspects like factorization, conjunctive coding, especially in the hippocampus are highly important um, so that you can basically provide compositional representations and have this, this binding of sensory specific to that structural information. So that's, if you like, a bit of a theoretical and in, in, in the latter case, a computational um, framework under which we operate with our experimental work. Um, one aspect which is very important, the domain generality of the processes. We think this map is not only there to help us navigate, but also to memorize, to make decisions to acquire new knowledge and apply uh, apply acquired knowledge also in areas like higher level vision. So we think really it's a, possibly a blueprint to understand different cognitive domains. And that's why we in the lab have really a lot of areas where we do research on space, time, memory, but also other areas. And I want to give you uh, in the rest of the talk now a couple of showcase examples of uh, fMRI studies where we investigate this. So let's start with uh, spatial navigation. So uh, in a study we performed a couple of years ago, we were wondering how the brain can sort of fulfill this function I illustrated at the beginning to represent context, spatial context, and then in a context appropriate manner, uh, perform the, the right behavior. That study has been done by Josh Julian, who was a postdoc in the lab, is now at Princeton University, following up with a second postdoc in systems neuroscience doing had some imaging recordings in rodents himself now. So what Josh did, he, uh, he trains participants in a virtual reality navigation task. So participants navigate through a virtual world and their task is to identify objects. It's a bit like an Easter egg hunt. Easter is upcoming, so you might do that with your children. So they have to look for the Easter eggs hidden in the garden here in that case participants navigate through a virtual environment, which is bounded by a wall. You have some, um, some trees as global orientation cues. You have to collect objects and memorize them. And then you are in the main, main experiment. You are cued by an image of one of these objects, have to go back to the position, basically bring the Easter egg back to the hidden location, press a button, then you get feedback of how close you have been. So object location memory task, we call it. Um, in that study, what is novel is we used three different environments. So participants started with two original environments, a square and a circle environment. Um, and you, Josh presented four different objects, the same objects in both environments, but they were presented at different positions. So when you look at object one over here, it's here in the square, but at a different position in the circle. What also differs between the environments is the orientation cues, these um, next to the shape of the environment, square versus circle. What also differs is uh, the, the position of these orientation cues, the trees. So um, uh, uh, that will be relevant in a second. And then the critical aspect about the study is in a 
in a, in a final session in the scanner, we expose participants to a hybrid environment, a mixture of a square and a circle, and Josh named it a squircle. Uh, and uh, that basically, you see that over here. Importantly, in that session, participants don't get feedback. There is no correct answer. And um, we provide also all these extra maze cues, these orientation cues, uh, so people don't really know whether they're in a square or a circle. They are now in an ambiguous novel environment. Let's first look at behavior in this squircle environment. So when participants uh, perform this object location memory task, what you see, and here you see the heat maps, they depict the difference in the square and the circle consistent recalled locations. What you see here is that for each object, two locations pop up. So this is basically across participants, the density plots of where they are most likely to respond. And what you see for every object, two positions emerge, usually nothing in between or only a little bit no noise in between. So when you look at object one, they either replace it over here, which is the square position, or they replace it over here. That's the blue position in the circle environment. And uh, so this is something we had to pilot, of course, but it looks really like in the majority of the trials, when people enter the circle environment, they either choose to replace a specific object, like object one here, at the original square position or at the original circle position. And of course, design-wise, you see that over here, we made sure that they are at different positions so that we have the statistical power to detect the difference between the object locations. In general, in terms of performance, they're doing well. They, there's no difference between the three environments in terms of the replaced performance. In the squircle environment, of course, they, since there is no true location for the object, we always take uh, the distance to the either the, the closer squircle, square or circle consistent location. Then we look at our fMRI signal. So what we do is we train a multivariate pattern classifier uh, correlation-based nearest neighbor multivariate pattern classifier, uh, to be more precise, to distinguish between the original square and circle contexts. So um, uh, this is a standard procedure. Uh, we look at the pattern of voxels in the hippocampus and train the classifier on some part of the data and test it on another part of the data and then sort of iterate, loop through the data set in a leaf one out procedure. And what you see here is in A, we can significantly classify based on the voxel pattern in the hippocampus where the participants are in the square or the circle environment. You might wonder that's not, not very surprising because these environments differ in terms of the shape and the, and, the, and the trees and so forth. When we then look, that's maybe also an interesting effect at B, and that's where we look at the activity pattern evolving throughout a trial. So they enter the arena, um, they look around, and then they start navigating to replace the object. We basically compare every data set we have in a trial, a so-called TR, uh, um, our, our volume. And every from TR to TR, we look at the correlation of the across voxel pattern in the hippocampus to, if you like, a template from the, uh, from the first session in the square and the circle alone. And what you see is that this contextual similarity effect emerges when they start navigating. This, this line indicates first they rotate, and then when they start navigating, these pattern diverge. So the pattern is either more similar to the square or the circle. It looks like they are activating when they navigate, um, uh, of course, the correct, the correct map, because they are physically in that map. Becomes interesting now when we apply the same technique to the ambiguous circle environment. So um, here we take the classifier we used initially or trained on the original square and circle environments, and then apply to every TR to, or to, to, to every trial in the squircle environment, in this ambiguous environment. And you might wonder, those of you who are familiar with this analysis, you need a label to train the classifier. So whether you're being in the square or the circle. Here, of course, they are in the ambiguous environment. We take behavior. So we take the information from behavior, um, which uh, is either close to the square or the circle position, and that's the label for the classifier. So we can basically, in this analysis, decode whether people in this ambiguous circle treat that environment 
as a square or a circle based on their performance or their behavior expressed at the end of the trial. And when we look at this uh, contextual similarity effect, of course, the effect is not as strong as in the original environments, but you see this div divergence. So they take a little longer uh, to deliberate, and but once they made a decision, these patterns uh, diverge. So they are activating either one or the other map, and that is then expressed in behavior. Of course, with fMRI, we need to make sure that that effect is really stable and not driven by unspecific factors. It's a complicated experiment. I illustrate this is one of these papers with many supplemental figures. I illustrate a few of these control analysis to give you a flavor of how uh, we usually try to be really careful with the interpretation of our data. So what we first did is we looked whether um, the specific position at which you are as a participant in the squircle environment can explain this effect in C and D. So um, you might wonder, okay, if I'm hanging around close to the corner of the squircle, of course, then because it looks visually like a square, I will activate reactivate the square map. And that's not the case. So when we plot um, this contextual similarity effect as a function of position within the ambiguous squircle environment, uh, you don't see a sort of a spatial distribution of the effect. So it's not the visual, the, it's not your position within the environment, which explains the effect. Um, and we can also yeah, factorize that analysis by separating four areas in the squircle, the two which are at the rounded segments and the other two uh, quadrants, which are at the, at the corner elements, and we don't see a difference between this contextual similarity. So it's not position in the squircle which drives the effect. And it's neither um, the, the view of these environment-specific um, boundary segments. So uh, we also don't see a difference between this contextual similarity effect when we analyze the data as a function of whether they look at a corner or a rounded segment, or and that's in F, whether they look at one of these um, extra maze tree cues from the original square or the circle environment. So it looks really that um, uh, you either activate one or the other map, and that is then expressed in behavior in that specific trial in the squircle in the hippocampus. We were, of course, also interested in the entorhinal cortex, so that regions one synapse away from the hippocampus, housing the beautiful grid cells. Many years ago, when I was a postdoc at, uh, in London, we developed a technique to identify something like a proxy measure of um, grid cell-like activity. We call it a hexadirectional signal. Uh, of course, with our sluggish fMRI response in voxels, which sums in a very unspecific way the activity of many 10,000, 100,000 of cells, it's very difficult to be close to what's going on on the single cell level. However, um, uh, in, in many areas of fMRI research, we are somehow sensitive to population activity. Of course, the the, the exact relationship between single cell population activity and, and uh, fMRI signal is not quite clear, but whenever, as a rule of thumb or as an approach, whenever um, a population of cells is doing one thing together in one experimental condition and something else, so the entire population changes responses in another condition or in another context, we have some chances to identify a proxy measure on the fMRI level. In the case of the grid cells, what we had identified many years ago, it's not position because we would not be able to decode the firing fields of each single cell and so forth. And it would also be flat when you plot that across cells uh, on the population level. But given the fact that the overall orientation of, the, of these grids, when you look at uh, the cell firing of many of these grid cells, the overall orientation, so this hexa hexagonal firing pattern is relatively constant across cells, at least big po populations of cells within modules in entorhinal cortex. So to uh, cut a long story short, what we look is not a positional correlate of grid cell-like activity, but at a directional correlate. So we plot activity as a function of running direction and look for this very specific, because it's a hexagonal structure, so uh, we look for these hex hexadirectional signals. So uh, as when we plot activity as a function of running direction, we expect six peaks with various controls. 
And uh, when Josh applies that to the original circle and square environments, what he sees is that he sees a robust hexadirectional can be interpreted as, as grid-like activity um, in entorhinal cortex. And um, when we take the estimated orientation of the grid or the phase, formally in terms of analysis, the phase of this hexadirectional signal from one environment and plug it into the other, we don't see the effect. This means that the orientation of this grid effect is different in the square square in the circle, probably coming from the different arrangement of these extra maze cues where the system usually aligns to. But again, now this is not very surprising with uh, the original environments. Now we, of course, were interested how the entorhinal cortex reactivates these specific maps for square and circle as a function of behavior in this ambiguous circle environment. We test a model where um, uh, this grid orientation aligns consistently with behavior versus inconsistently, and we see evidence for a consistent model. So whenever participants enter the circle, they, like in the hippocampal uh, map, they reactivate this grid-like representation from the original environment. And that's what we see evidence for. So in sum, as a key finding, hippocampal remapping, of course, always uh, um, with a grain of salt because we should not over inter never overinterpret our fMRI effects in terms of cell firing, but it's a remapping-like phenomenon we see, and if you like, an entorhinal realignment effect that predicts uh, spatial memory in a very context-dependent manner. But of course, space is not everything. When you think about episodic memory, um, based on original definitions. Um, of, of, of memory theories, what is critical is not only the spatial context where an event happens, but also the time. I give several talks and the content is similar, but uh, and it might also be if it's a virtual talk, it might be always here sitting or standing in my office. But of course, the time is different. It's uh, today uh, the, the, the talk with you and in a couple of weeks, maybe with, with another group of people. So time is very important to identify specific episodes and is highly important for episodic memory. That's why I want to show, uh, present the showcase example in the temporal domain. So this is a study uh, conducted by Ignacio Polti. He just finished his PhD, um, submitted the thesis and is about to uh, defend his thesis. He starts actually also with a, as a systems neuroscientist then uh, a, a new postdoc already started that with Edward and Margaret Moser. Also a colleague from France, Virginie van Bassenhover, an expert on temporal processing from Neurospin in Paris, was involved in the study. So um, completely different tasks. So this is what we used to do in the lab, uh, apply different cognitive tasks coming from different areas. So this is a so-called time to contact task. So the task of participants um, is uh, to just follow with their eyes this moving disk. And this disk is moving all over again uh, across this uh, screen. And sometimes it disappears, or it always disappears before it hits the wall. And the task of participants is to indicate when they think the disappeared disk hits the nearby wall. We manipulate speed here. So we have four conditions. You see that here. So um, uh, this disk moves at different speeds. And of course, that makes the task a bit more difficult because you have to take into account the spatial position and then sort of estimate the, the time as a function of the speed when the object hits or the disk hits the nearby wall. Unknown to participants, and I'll tell you in a second what the reason is, we carefully control the trajectories of the disk. So we have a sort of beautiful sampling of all directions uh, in the experiment and we monitor participants' behavior by eye tracking that they really follow this, this dot with their eyes. So first on a behavioral level, we replicate findings from the literature using that task. So it's a classical regression to the mean effect. So we plot here the target time to contact TTC. Uh, so uh, this is sort of the, the, uh, the optimal re response for the four speed levels as a function of what they estimate in terms of the TTC. And you see a typical regression to the mean effect. So participants' responses were systematically biased to, towards the grand mean of this TTC distribution. 
indicating that shorter durations are basically tended to be overestimated while longer durations are underestimated. I can show you a little animation over time from, uh, uh, for, over, uh, pat, uh, over one, for one participant where you see um, that over time and you see the percentage of trials in an experiment at the, at the, at the beginning, people are still unsure and then this regression to the mean effect sort of emerges throughout the experiment. Classical finding, nothing new. We also calculated some more complex uh, behavior measures, which might be relevant or will be relevant a little later when we when I present the fMRI findings, um, uh, which is a measure of uh, uh, precision accuracy trade-off. Um, the let's now talk about the uh, fMRI findings. So um, the um, um, uh, in this in this study, we performed basically a very similar analysis to the one from Josh presented before in, in virtual reality. We look at hexadirectional sickness in entomorphinal cortex. And um, we have developed that also a couple, a couple of years ago, where we rather than taking the virtual position of participants when they navigate a virtual reality environment, but here we, we analyze the data as a function of their gaze position and gaze movement, gaze direction. So they follow with their eyes this moving disc. And we can also, of course, like in the VR setup when they navigate around, analyze their gaze behavior as a function uh, of direction uh, and relate that to our fMRI signal. When we do that is we see also a hexadirectional grid-like effect in entorhinal cortex. Interestingly, and that was surprising to us, we have not expected that we only see that for one speed level. That is that third speed level. And uh, it becomes clear now why we see that. So uh, we also look at the spatial stability of the signal. So how similar across entorhinal voxels is that signal? There's no difference between the four speed levels, but there's a significant difference in the temporal stability. So with temporal stability, I mean, when you look at one half of the data and then at the other half of the data is the orientation of this grid-like effect, the phase of this hexadirectional signal on coherent, consistent across the halves of the experiment. And that's only, in terms of spatial uh, temporal stability, only the case for the third speed level. And when I just quickly go back, the third speed level is the one which is identical or very close to this grand mean of the distribution. So uh, we also uh, try to relate that to behavior. So we look for the strength of this hexadirectional grid-like effect for the third speed level close to the grand mean and correlated to behavior. Uh, this um, precision accuracy trade-off measure I introduced before, and we see a relationship here so that um, participants with a high performance in the task also have the strongest hexadirectional entorhinal signal in that third speed level. Um, we also applied a computational model, basically a, a, a Bayesian observer model, and trained the model on one half of the data, the predicted data, and tested on the observed, uh, observed other half of the data. And in a Bayesian framework, you have these priors. We placed the priors, the prior, on this grand average um, time. And as controls, we took the other three times. And the strongest effect to explain behavior, we find with the model where we set the prior to the grand mean of the distribution. And uh, we then, in a final step, take the model predicted behavior and correlate that with our fMRI effect and see a similar correlation like in the uh, data analysis where we take the or plug in the actual behavior. So in sum, we provide in that study some evidence that uh, grid-like signals in entorhinal cortex seem to be modulated by the regularities of the temporal context. So the brain seems to be, to be sensitive about this. Yeah, you can call it structural information. It's basically the temporal equivalent to what I described in my example with supermarket and Natalia visiting the Leipzig supermarket in the spatial domain. We see basically a corresponding type of representation in entorhinal cortex for temporal regularities. 
uh, which then again also explain uh, behavior. So the findings suggest that participants rely not only on sensory measurements of time intervals, but also take into account these prior expectations and, 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 and build this, this uh, structural representation of uh, time here. As I mentioned in my introduction, we think that these maps, because they are in, in one situation very stable, but also in another situation very dynamic, also provide a very important basis for decision making. So um, having a representation of your either spatial or non-spatial environment gives you that critical structural information which allows you to basically make adequate decisions. We illustrate that in, with me in that example, where you actually uh, decide between cars with uh, less and more um, uh, seats and, uh, and, and uh, higher and lower in price, how to really draw on that cognitive map representation of cars to make your uh, decisions. And I want to present a study which was performed by Mona Garvard, a previous postdoc, and then Gubita uh, in the lab, who uh, is the first author of the study and who is now an assistant professor in the University of Würzburg. Other people were involved, especially for the modeling components. Nico Schuck, who was a group leader at a Max Planck Institute in Berlin, is now a professor in Hamburg. And Eric Schulz, who was uh, a Max Planck group leader in an institute in Tübingen in South Germany and is now a professor in Munich. So also, again, completely different cognitive task, cognitive experiment, um, including various components. And I will try to guide you through the task. So let's maybe start with the logic of the experiment. So participants, and as you see here, it's a three-day experiment, so quite a time investment for participants and researchers. <clears throat> participants come in to the lab and are, again, exposed to a virtual reality environment. So they navigate, like in Josh's study, uh, a VR environment, and they also have to learn different objects at different locations, object location memory tasks. Uh, unlike the task in Josh's case, where we determine which objects the participants are sampling in the initial phase, here they are completely free to explore. So they navigate the environment and then an object appears, they pick it up, they explore another object and that takes on for a whole session on day one. In total, Mona presented 16 objects, these little funny monsters. And participants develop different strategies, how they sample the object. Unknown to the participants, we had uh, two critical experimental manipulations. So uh, items uh, items were later, I'll tell you about that in a second, in a, in a later task that's then on day two, um, it's a choice task in the scanner, participants um, learned associated reward values, rewards, uh, uh, learned the association between these little monsters and rewards. Some of the objects were, some of the monsters were rewarded, others were not. And unknown to participants, this stimulus to reward association, the differences in stimulus to reward associations differed as a function of the spatial position of the monsters in the initial session on day one. So that's illustrated here. We had in total two contexts, uh, a red context where these items which are presented in dark red are the highly rewarded items. So this is the high, highest rewarded item, and then these are a little less rewarded, these others are not rewarded. In contrast, in the blue context, another we basically had another reward zone, basically. Um, so that objects which were uh, originally presented over here uh, were highly rewarded, the others were not rewarded. A second critical features apart from this reward manipulation as a function of the position of the monsters in space, we also manipulated, or we also presented, in this choice task, in total four monsters, which have been never, sorry, in the in the later task, evaluating map reproduction, I'll tell you in a second. Um, we, we also, uh, for some of these monsters, we don't provide reward information. So they're never rewarded. And they are, uh, we call them inference objects. They are 
objects one, two, and three and four. Object one is basically never rewarded, but is spatially positioned very close in the initial session to the highly rewarded items in context one. While another object, another monster, is never rewarded and was originally presented far away from the highly rewarded object. And likewise, we have the same for the blue context, one which is close to highly rewarded items, number three, one which is further away from, from, from that reward area. So when we now look at the value weighting, and so the choice task is the one where we experimentally manipulate the reward state and people learn to associate different reward levels with different monsters. And we have these four objects which are never rewarded. Then we basically do a behavioral readout of the associated learned reward uh, state of these monsters. And when we do that, so they have to rate the value, they, pre they are presented with all the monsters on the screen and have to rate or with a slider the value uh, of the associated reward. And what we see here is that um, uh, the uh, participants do that very well for the um, uh, uh, for the uh, for, in general, so uh, for 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 the items, but they also do so, and that's the the finding I plot in in plot E. They also do for the inference objects, and of course more so, and that's the difference between the the first two bars and the second two bars. They do more so. They ascribe a higher value, a reward value, despite the fact that these objects have never been rewarded to the inference objects one, which is close to the, spatially close to the rewarded objects compared to object two, which is far away. So we have a spatial bias in the, in the inferred reward state associated with these monsters, which actually have never been rewarded. This effect, so this inference error or inference performance correlates across participants with how well participants know the spatial environment. And um, this is a measure we call map reproduction error. So they basically have to rearrange the objects in space at the very end of the experiment the closer they match the object locations to the two positions the higher this map reproduction value is and people with a good spatial map what you could assume have also the higher inference performance so um ascribe high inference uh, high values to the inferred objects which are close to the reward compared to the uh, objects which are far away from the reward so then we can try to dig a bit deeper on the behavior and now in that case also computational level what drives this effect so what you see here is a three example path of participants real data from the experiment how they sample the object in the very initial um, exploration session in virtual reality while participant one has a sort of clear path you see that through the thick lines they sample these directions very frequently participant two uses more like a circle strategy always approaching the the outer objects and then going into the middle and the third one just pursues some sort of six course through the environment with no systematic sampling so there are huge behavioral differences and in the end, we are interested in behavior and the relationship to neural representations. There's a huge behavioral difference between participants. This here is now the graph representation. You can plug that into a graph analysis in terms of hardness and strength of connectivity. That's just for illustration, the graph representation of these effects. And then um, uh, Tankred Zanum, so a doctoral researcher from um, Eric Schulz lab, he applied a Gaussian process model um, uh, to to the data again i also don't understand the details of the model and you don't need to understand it but in brief what the gaussian process model does it predicts the reward for a novel stimulus based on the rewards associated with all the other stimuli so you have a stimulus to stimulus um a correlation matrix in terms of uh, associations or similarity values and for the novel stimuli it basically looks up the reward associations with all other stimuli and weighted by their similarity to the novel stimulus. And the similarity in this experiment can now come from two sources. It could be basically the ground truth, which is the spatial location in the initial experimental phase. It can also be the temporal or the predict predictive relationship 
And that depends really on the individual sampling of participants, how they sample these different objects, because we gave them the free choice how to sample and explore these objects. And we put these two pieces of information, the, sim uh, the similarity, the spatial similarity and the temporal, or we call it predictive similarity, into the model to explain behavior in the choice weighting and then also uh, in the choice, the choice task and in its value weighting where they um, uh, weight the associated reward to each object. And what you see here is that the, the model which best explains the behavioral data in the choice task is a model where we have spatial and temporal kernels. So where you take into account the spatial and the predictive or temporal relationship between the, uh, between the objects. And you also see that the model can beautifully, when you go back again, when I go back again, beautifully replicate this evaluating effect, um, uh, which we see in behavior. Um, then a couple of more data. So this model predicted inference effect correlates across participants with the inference effect um, in, the, in the real behavioral data. So the model has really a good predictive power. Uh, the value rating, again, is best explained by this combined model where we take spatial and predictive or temporal relationships into account. And uh, in F, you see that the spatial effect, which is effectively the ground truth, because it, for the reward, it doesn't matter how they sample it, but of course it can introduce um, a, a prior into, uh, into, the, into the reward task. But it's the spatial effect, which is the ground truth, um, correlates negatively with the predictive effect. So participants either use the spatial proximity values or the temporal, how they sample them, but only the spatial, but not the temporal weight of the model can explain that inference behavior. So it's really that people learn this spatial ground truth and which drives their uh, performance. Um, very briefly, and then I also finish my talk very soon, um, we look at uh, fMRI effects. We take basically an fMRI measure of uh, spatial map representation where we look at, in that case, fMRI adaptation as a measure to measure the neural distance or similarity between locations in the environment. That spatial map effect in the hippocampus correlates with the spatial effect on choice behavior. So participants with the stronger map representation in the hippocampus also, uh, their behavior is more driven by the spatial kernel uh, as measured by the model. And uh, the spatial fMRI effect also explains the inference per, uh, performance we see. Finally, when we look at the evolution of this effect across time within the experiment, and when we uh, basically plot um, the, the development of this spatial influence, spatial weight on behavior in the majority of the participants. So each line here in A indicates uh, one participant. The, for the majority of the participants, the spatial weight takes over. So that guides more and more behavior. So basically people uh, rely more on the ground truth of the experiment, less so the predictive or temporal information. And the slope of that effect, so the faster participants rely on the ground to spatial proximity in their reward decision, um, the stronger the inference error is. And this slope of the effect, the faster participants take into account the spatial information in their reward decision also correlates with this fMRI effect of map representation in the hippocampus. So in sum, the key finding of that study is that hippocampal cognitive maps to adaptively guide reward generalization, generalization in this task. I will conclude with a short outline into one study, which comes from a different area, but I want to illustrate also that we try to develop also new methods. This is a study done by Markus uh, Frey and Matthias Now, previous doctoral researchers in the lab. Markus is now a postdoc in Lausanne. Uh, he's a computational neuroscientist, AI researcher. Matthias is a cognitive neuroscientist after a postdoc after he was with us at the NIH in at Bethesda near Washington in the US. He is now an assistant professor at uh, in Amsterdam. So completely different story, just as an illustration at the end of the of the talk. Um the uh Usually when we do fMRI experiments, uh, we of course measure whole brain. Um, 
and we also record signal from the eyeballs. But usually we, um, we move that information. We are not interested in the MRI signal related to the eyes. We are only interested in the, in the brain data. However, there is some useful information sitting in the MRI signal of the eyeballs because the signal, because the eyeballs move and the moving object in the magnetic field produces some signal and you, there's some systematic effect of these uh, eye movements in the scanner. When you look up the image of the eyeballs, the MR, the MR signal, in the, uh, it looks different compared to looking down and left and right. And Matthias and Markus used that information to analyze existing data. So data come from a lot of data sets, either so vision neuroscience experiments, fixation experiments, smooth pursue, like in Ignacio studies where you have to follow a moving disk, um, uh, and but also uh, visual search experiments. So a huge data set uh, in total, I think more than or almost 250 data sets. And the key thing here is they apply techniques from artificial intelligence, deep neural networks, you're familiar with that. Again, I also don't understand the inner working of the models, but uh, Markus is really the expert here. Uh, they applied a deep neural network to predict eye movements based on the MR signal coming from the eyeballs. If you want, they try to perform eye tracking. You know, these eye trackers in the scanner where we monitor the eye movements, which is uh, difficult or sometimes difficult to set up or it takes a lot of time. Um, do eye tracking, but without an eye tracker, just with the MR signal coming from the eyeballs. And what you see here is um, some, some examples from participants using uh, doing these different tasks. So. Uh, um, the the back the black line shows the ground truth. So the the eye movements monitored by the by the physical eye tracking machine or, or um, uh, instrument, and uh, the green line shows uh, shows the prediction coming from deep MRI. They call it the deep neural network. And you see, it's a really striking similarity of the effect. This is just another example from a smooth pursuit experiment. It's less precise, but still strikingly. Uh, strikingly high performance uh, in the case of visual search. We can do statistics on that, how well the um, uh, the, um, the AI tool, the deep net, can explain eye, eye movements. And uh, when you look at the sort of effect here in, this, in the lower panel, uh, of course, for the fixation and the pursuit experiments, it's more precise, but even for the free viewing, it's really... Um, uh, within a few degrees of space, uh, how we can decode eye movement. So um, just as a sort of uh, uh, illustration of some methods work we're doing in the lab, uh, so this deep MRI is basically cameraless eye tracking. Uh, it's robust across, uh, Matthias and Marcus did all the sanity checks, they're robust across a broad range of scanning protocols, different voxel sizes, different scanners, different DRs, different cognitive tasks. It allows out of sample prediction. So meaning that the model has never seen test participants during training, but because we trained the model, it can be applied to any data. Very importantly, it can be applied retrospectively. So even in an experiment where you have not done any eye movement, uh, any eye tracking, you can retrospectively look at eye movement related effects in your fMRI signal. Uh, they played around a little bit with them and, and scanned themselves. It even works with eyes closed and uh, it's an open software solution um, which is provided to the community. So let me briefly wrap up. So I hope I provided some evidence that these spatial maps provide context tem tem dependent memory representations which guide behavior. I also showed you an example of how uh, entorhinal cortex represents the temporal regularities. I illustrated how these maps can be used for reward generation. Another study I didn't have time to present. I showed you some of our methods work. And I think for future directions, it's really important to understand and define what structure of the environment mean. How is actually the structural information about a supermarket extracted? What is structural information? What is not structural information? This is also what behavioral work can, of, of course, tell us. How, how does the brain detect that information and leverage that information? How abstract can this structural information be? Does it not only apply to supermarkets, but any shops, for instance? And the critical question in the field is how these sensory specific informations are mapped onto the structural representation. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. I highlighted the people who actually did the work as first authors. 
and I'm more than happy to take your questions now and I hope I stayed yeah, within one hour, so as promised. Thanks so much. <laughs>